Depuis la fin du 19e siècle, Since the late 19th century, there has been in France and in the industrial world a number of NGOs and groups that are active in the protection of the environment. And since 1986, many of them have followed the evolutions in scientific knowledge and say that they are also engaged in protecting biodiversity. In the century, the world has changed a lot, as have NGOs. What can be said today about the evolution of the forms, actions and practices in the field of biodiversity? To answer this question, one can identify four key moments over the 12 or 13 last decades, which can help us to understand the current structure of the NGO, NGO world, but that can also help us to identify a number of key challenges or dilemmas which these uh, players face. The first moment was the creation towards the end of the 19th century of the great NGOs of conservation or protection of nature. These great NGOs still exist. For instance, in the US, the Sierra Club, that was founded in 1892, which aims to protect nature through the protection of wilderness and the great spaces, modeled on the national parks of America. It's also in France in 1912, the creation of the LPO, the League for the Protection of Birds, which was involved in the creation of the the Seven Islands Reserve, Bird Reserve, in Brittany. So from the late 19th century until the late 1960s, these NGOs are highly active but not very political. They do not have a specific social project. They are mobilized against the destruction of natural spaces or a certain number of iconic animal species but do so in a silo and do not question the organization of society as a whole that generates these destructions. The second key moment seems to move the other way towards the late 60s and early 70s with the arrival of next generation NGOs that look beyond the protection of nature, beyond the protection of spaces and species to try to make a more explicit link with what is starting to be known as the global environmental crisis. This is a very specific historical moment because it also is the time when political environmentalism was born. To make the link between protecting nature and, on the other hand, rethinking the manner in which society is organized, society which is destroying environments, deforestation, the species becoming extinct, is what is known as the global ecological crisis. Within this new context, the protection of nature means that we need to challenge the attachment of modern society to productivism, growth, consumerism, and so on. So this new generation includes the WWF, founded in the US in 1961, Friends of the Earth, also founded in the US in 1969, or Greenpeace, founded in 1971 in Canada. This is also the time of one of the great environmental struggles in France, that for the preservation of the national park of the Vanoise, which was under threat between 1969 and 1971 by a uh, ski resort project. This is when the networks were established, which later become the French Federation of, of uh, Natural Protection association later became which later became FNE France Nature Environnement so the purpose of these NGOs is really to apply pressure to the government and uh, the very vibrant existence led to a number of major advances the creation of the Ministry of the Environment in 1971 the uh, loi littoral the seashore laws in 1976 and the third moment 
over the decades is a form of institutionalization of these uh, NGOs. Institutionalization is not necessarily said in a bad way. It's an evolution of the forms and strategies of these NGOs with greater involvement and participation in the institutional world something more routine, more peaceful, more institutionalized. In political sciences, there are usually three major criteria for institutionalization. The first one is organizational growth, an increase of human and financial resources available to the NGO. The second criteria is internal institutionalization, a trend within the NGO itself to become more professional, less and less based on uh, volunteers, but on the know-how of professionals who work in the NGO sector. And the third one is external institutionalization, manifested by a strategic reorganization with NGOs that are increasingly going to be using expertise or lobbying uh, to the detriment of more controversial modes of action. They're also going to seek partnerships with industry rather than merely denouncing their practices. One can note that major NGOs for the protection of nature or biodiversity went actually quite far in recent years in this institutionalization process, especially external institutionalization. This took on the form of dialogue, which became more established with public authorities, more frequent involvement in consultation committees or formal negotiations. And one can say that probably the high point of this institutionalization was the experiment of the Grenelle de l'Environnement in 2007, when dialogue was systematic. The purpose of the Grenelle de l'Environnement was explicitly to drop confrontation in favor of a culture of dialogue and conciliation in, uh, uh, the, with the view that this would make it easier to obtain results that were acceptable by all. If we look at the FNE, for instance, that was born during the Vanoise Park, uh, quite a a highly strong struggle, but which then became much more involved in co-management and consultation with the public authorities. And on the national level, it is now present in 200 different consultation bodies. The ROC, the ROC, which is was, was an anti-hunting NGO founded in 1976, and very violently so, but which uh, at the start of the century started to take a less uh, controversial position and became the, an NGO called Humankind and Biodiversity, much more based on harmonious cohabitation. Through the institutionalization of the NGO sector, the institutionalization is not necessarily a problem in itself, but it does have a number of consequences. First consequence, the mechanical effect is that it strengthens NGOs who wish to advance compromise to the detriment of uh, more militant NGOs. And institutionalization also uh, encourages compromise, sometimes to the detriment of uh, evidencing difficulties or dilemmas that exist and which may be uh, posed by the protection of biodiversity. And more importantly, institutionalization poses the question of the degree of independence of uh, civil society in the conduct of uh, policies. How much can they oppose when they still feel they need to? Are they not constrained by their institutional role to a form of self-censorship until to the point where they can become a kind of alibi for a predatory system which refuses to change or changes very little? That's a question posed by the fourth moment, which is the moment we're experiencing now. Since the Grenelle de l'Environnement, have we not reached the end of a cycle? After a very strong institutionalization of the NGO sector, are we not witnessing a renewal 
of uh, actions uh, in favor of biodiversity that are more uh, protest-based, less formal. That's very much the case in the ZADs, the zones to be defended in Notre-Dame-des-Landes Airport and elsewhere. Usually these are driven by small NGOs or collectives, sometimes entirely informal but highly active in the field, to denounce the uh, destruction of biodiversity. And these movements also are, in a sense, a return to the spirit of the 70s in the way they articulate biodiversity locally with a more global chain of thought about the limitations of an economic and social model based purely on growth at any cost. So these various moments, these various trends that are not necessarily contradictory, reflect a hesitation in the degree of protest or the degree of conciliation necessary to protect nature and biodiversity. One could say that there probably is complementarity between the most institutionalized and the most militant organizations, but sometimes a number of choices are necessary, such as renouncing major projects. And this can only be done through a protest, which is not very compatible with excessive institutionalization.